Yes. All right. We good. We live. We live. We are one hundred percent live. All right. All right. Not ninety nine. <laughs> not ninety eight. Not one and a quarter. Nah, baby. We one hundred percent today, man. Um, it's a great day to be alive. You know, it's a great day to not be able to dream and, and live out our dreams every day. You know what I mean? So, Mondo. Truth to Create podcast. You know, episode number thirteen. You know, we started what like two weeks ago, three. Three right. weeks ago or something right. like that. Got a good amount and, of episodes um, in. Good amount of episodes in and like um really like what it, what what sparked it all was like the the us, like the the culture, like you guys, the 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 creatives, mm-hmm. the content creators out there, you guys kinda like sparked that idea. And I was like, let's just have a, a spot where we could kick it, you know what I mean? Where we could kinda just talk about um the creative expression, some of the ways that we go about developing our creative expression, some of the ways that we go about marketing our services and even even um uh, showing our value. I don't like to be like oh pricing, but kinda like showing our value and you know everything is is all about being able to um properly put that out there. That's you right. Know? That's right. So um I love connecting with entrepreneurs and especially creative professionals that build these type of things and that's actually out here doing it. And um, yeah, man. So that's what this truth to create thing is, man. It's just say this is a extension of the meetup that we do every month. That's what's up. All right. That's you right. right. I mean? Thank you for having me, man. For real. Hey, man. I appreciate Absolutely. I appreciate you being on on here with us right now, man. Like, um, like you came. You we always connected, and you was like always just grinding. For sure, man. You like, know. you know what I'm saying? The grind is real, man. It's like, you know, like the life of an entrepreneur is just that. Like, you, you constantly, constantly have to stay on the grind. I mean, it's just like, and then you have to love it. You know what I mean? So if you, and that's the one thing, you know, I, like I tell a lot of people that GP is my, it's my house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I live here because it's like, literally, I love being here. I love doing it. I love the journey, you know, all the trials and tribulations that come with it. But, you know, the freedom also. You know, that comes with having your own business and, you know, steering your own ship. Like, you know, you can't replace that. So, yeah, the grind is real, but, man, yeah, the grind is definitely all love. So, I love it, man. Oh, yeah, love man. It. Not for sure, man. Got 100% love it, man. You know, um, so, like, getting into it, like, as far as, like, um, were you, did you always have a creative firm? Because you could have been into any, any, any world, really. But uh, was it you started with creative or well, like, originally, how, was that, how was that transition? Into being into? Yeah, like originally, you know, I started off my professional career doing sales. You okay. know? So I did sales for a couple of decades, to be honest with you. And um, around 08, um, I was selling at, selling radio advertisements for Cox Media, Hot 105, 99 Jams. Um, and then that's when the recession hit, like, you know, the dot-com bubble, not the dot-com, but the other uh, housing bubble hit and killed everything, you know what I mean? And then, like, everybody got laid off from that job. It's crazy. So when I got laid off from that job, man, I went back to art school because originally I wanted to go to art school. Um, so I did that, man. And then, um, you know, once I was in art school, I came out of there. Um, I got a job working in, um, I got a, d- d- a degree in graphic design, bachelor's of fine arts, um, and I got a, a job working for a polo company. In Wellington, it was just basically graphic design and apparel. So I really started off my career in apparel, and I did that for three and a half, almost four years there. And then I left, and then I came to GP, and I started my own company doing the same thing. And originally it was that, um, and it was good. You know, I won't even front; it was good. Um, you know, it was really niche because you know it was just something real specific, equestrian, and all of that. Um, but I didn't really have my heart into it, into it. You know, I really had my heart into the money I was getting. It was mm-hmm. great conversation, man. Um, but um, one day I had to go get a drone. You know what I'm saying? Because, mm-hmm. you know, drone footage was the thing. You know, it was starting to become real big. Mm-hmm. Um, and you needed to have it in your repertoire. So I went out and bought a really, really cheap drone just so I could learn how to do it. And when I started filming the video, I got the video back and started to edit. And that was it. I was like, man, this is it. Like, this is it. Like, I love this. Um, and then after that, man, I really, I started the transition then of transition in my business from, um, an apparel business to a video business. And I even went and worked for a corporation for a while, TBC corporation doing videos for Sumitomo automotive videos for tire kingdom. Um, you know, I've done stuff for, uh, for Midas muffler, like all of those brands, um, and just learned kind of like almost like an agency style, um, with, uh, with video work and all that work, man. And then when COVID hit. 
just forced everybody to do their own thing, man. You know, so you know, we were you know furloughed from that from that gig for you know six months. They brought us back, but then when they brought us back, I was just like, no, nah, man, I'm on my own. By that time, I had secured my largest deal ever. It's like a five figure deal. Um, for Adios Golf Club, um, it was just fantastic, and I used that money to start, you know, the business that is 1881 right now. You know, so right now, you know, we went from doing, you know, again, apparel all the way to all types of videos to now specifically, you know, our largest client um, and our largest clients are security industry clients. So we deal with technology companies, and we also deal with, um, you know, just regular security companies. Um, you know, so it's it's a cool thing. We really, really just niche down, you know, after that year. So, and that's where we are right now. That's really, you know, how the journey has been. And it's it's been a crazy one, uh, a fun one, but, mm-hmm. like, it's right now we're focused. So I'm excited about the future. Nah, man, that's dope, bro. Like, um, just kind of, like, going from, from, from one spot. Like, you, you, you went through you went through the, the, the transitions, but I'm going to break it down a little bit slow so we can talk about it. You know what I mean? Because I know, I know that journey. And it's, it's 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 a fun, exciting, and dope journey because, like, you gotta constantly be creative, right? But um, I don't know that journey, which is apparel, right? Um, graphic design, mm-hmm. right? And um, selling apparel and stuff like that. So like, once you started selling apparel, what is some of the things that you noticed was was selling and was not selling in that in that industry? Was it like the stripes or the polka dots? <laughs> Well, it's, it's funny, man, you mentioned that. It's like the, the company that I work for really, you know, I was the art director there, man. So I created their whole visual style. And it's like, you know, lots of things we were really seeing was popping. But the main thing that we really focused on, man, is like gradients and fading techniques in the, in the process that we were using for um, creating jerseys. So I used to make jerseys for, you know, professional polo teams. And we had a process dye sublimation. And we could do anything that you wanted to do on a shirt, right? You know, we could do fades, we could do different colors, all kinds of different things, you know what I mean, graphics and whatnot. And at the time, no one in the polo world was doing that. So when we started doing it, and I developed that sky, that style, a lot of people grab, gravitated towards that style. Like, you know, the, the, probably my, my crowning achievement is doing the Veeb Clicquot um, classic jerseys for the Veeb Clicquot uh, classic uh, that they have in New York, polo classic, uh, and in Los Angeles, man. And even to this day right now, I, I created those jerseys 2012, I think it was, and mm-hmm. right now here it is 2022, and they still rock those jerseys 10 years, 10 years later. I don't work for the company anymore, not even affiliated with it anymore, but still Vive Clico still rocks those jerseys because of that style. So, yeah, man, it was like stripes, chevrons, you know, and then the And what's chevrons? And, so it's just like, like arrows, you know what I'm saying? Arrows, but just long chevrons, arrows and whatnot that point up and down because, oh, you know, man. the whole point was to try to make the, the body look slender, mm-hmm. so you would design like the, you know, the patterns and whatnot to try to, you know, make the body look like mm-hmm. it's chiseled, you know what I mean? So that was really the style. Like, try to make, because a lot of the people that played the sport, man, they were kind of bigger, so you want to try to make something that kind of, like, gives them, like, the visual Illusion. effect. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, you know, like, Photoshop. Fabric. So it's like, it's a, I, got, I, know you, I know what you're saying. Yeah. It's, like, it's like that, those type of lines. It's usually just two lines. Or sometimes if they have multiple, a few, be cut, yeah, like, cut and low, yeah, yeah, tight to the bottom. So, yeah, so those were interesting, man. But, yeah, like, those things and, you know, just the fabrics were pretty, you know, the thing that was really interesting. People were interested in, like, you know, really performance fabric and, you know, things that were, like, breathable and antimicrobial and different things like that. So, but, uh, yeah, this is a cool, cool interest you to be in for a while. Nah, for sure, man, because, like, you know, as you know, we just started picking up a, a new a new um, hobby, which is golf. Golfing, yeah. Golfing. <laughs> and that's some of the things I've been noticing even with golfing is, like, the materials, yeah. the breathable materials. I yeah. just got like another golf shirt. I'm like, okay, let me start stacking them a little golf you, man, gear. So you see, I wear it nice. every day almost. Yeah. You know what I'm it's saying? Nice. It it's nice. It's comfortable. comfortable. Yeah, it's breathable, yeah. and especially out there in the heat. Yeah, I learned another. I learned another trick. Um, is that you need a hat. Yeah, you need Absolutely. a cap. Yeah, and not even a hat. You need a cap when you're out there on the golf course. You yeah. understand me? For sure. Your whole head would be hot. All this, all the grease, all the uh, all the oil you put in that thing, that thing gonna be cooking. You be burning up, man. So um, there, just having sure. a hat out there and stuff like that, and I even notice certain styles. Like certain styles would be just like, uh, like say for instance, if for this pink, it would be like, um, boats, 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 like a patterns repeated a patterns, yeah. or it would be like small little dots, or it'd be just like lines. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that was all like, where it's, it's simple, it's just clean. But for the most part, the main thing for me is like the way that it's 
fits right. and the way that it feels on your skin. So that design is important too. But um, the way it feels on you is, is just as important as well. Oh, for sure. For sure, man. That's definitely, man. Yeah. How, you know, the fit and all of that, yeah, man. Mm-hmm. You know, actually the actual performance of the, of the garment and whatnot, man. So, yeah, that's always really big. Sure. Dope. And then, so, like, I want to get into it, too. Like, like so, when you when you already doing something, right? For me, I was, like, before that, I was, like, rapping or whatever, something like that. And then when I when I found video, I was at film school in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was, um, I was actually going to school for audio production. Mm-hmm. And, boom, first class, they gave us a project to do, like, a short film type one. Mm-hmm. And I was a director. So, you know, I came up with the script, came up with the concept, came mm-hmm. up with the storyline, da 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 and um, shot it, right? And after I shot it, we edit. Mm-hmm. After we edit, we looked at it, and we re-edit. And then we got ready to show it in front of the class, right? Right. We added sound effects and different types of stuff to it, man. It was a dope little story, and we showed it to the class. So now I can see exactly, like... This last two or three, last two weeks of work or whatever, mm-hmm. um, a project that we we all and it's like a whole group of like five six of us put in right, everybody put in yeah, yeah to put in to make this joint yeah you feel what I'm saying yeah um yeah after that that was it you know and then my my teacher she she like she like yo you switch your major to video yeah. like you pretty good at that like yeah when you put the concept and the story together like yeah you pretty good at that you should think about it and I'm like. Word. That's what's up, man. You Change know. right then and there. That yeah. same day. Yeah. Boom. Let me switch my joint. I like this. Mm-hmm. You know, so like I wanted to go to like where you were saying like um you were doing the shirts and mm-hmm. the first I didn't even know you the drone was like the first thing you kinda hit here. Like drone, you flew a drone to learn how to shoot drones and then mm-hmm. did a video and that was it. That kinda like started that. Tell me about like how that happened. Well, it's like, you know, I had, you know, photography experience and whatnot, you know, because, you know, that was something that, you know, we did in art school as well. And I had a camera and Sony camera and whatnot, but I didn't have a video, you know, video on mm-hmm. my camera. Okay. Um, so, you know, as far as just, you know, learning, like, so I, I knew, like, some basic concepts as far as, like, framing and, you know, and maybe composition mm-hmm. and whatnot. So, you know, you try to follow those 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 rules when you're doing it for the video, at least for the drone. But um, it was, like, the discovery of, of, of people that were doing video, like I discovered in like three or four days, Peter McKinnon, um, Casey Neistat, uh, who else? Uh, Gary V, um, like all of these video, big video centric, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Henry, especially Peter McKinnon, right? Especially Peter McKinnon, man. Like that was my main, that was my main dude for a while. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And it's like, it was just all of this information, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, that you know that I was able to get to be able to get better at mm-hmm. what it is that I was doing with the drone. And then just naturally, it's like, especially watching Peter, mm-hmm. it was just like, you know, first it was just drone video, whatever. And then you see him just, oh, he's working with the cameras, he's working with the camera. I'm like, okay, that looks good. And you don't kind of see it at first. But then, mm-hmm. you know, when you start editing, you're like, okay, I get it, I get it. And, so, and it was just like, oh, the next step was like, all right, I need to get myself a camera. You know, uh, with with video in it, because I need also now regular footage to go with the drone footage, man. And then, you know, I went and purchased um, my first camera. It was a Sony A6000. I still have it. Um, but, uh, and from there, I started doing more video. Um, and then when I got a, a gimbal, that changed the game. Mm-hmm. You know, I got a, a, a Fiutech, I think it's an AK2000. Mm-hmm. Like, really, so again, really cheap entry level or whatever, but, like, that was it. Like mm-hmm. I was able to develop a visual style, my own visual style with, with stabilized the gi- with video. The gimbal. Yeah. yeah. The gimbal, and that was that, it, That's man. a game changer for yeah, sure, for, for sure. sure. For sure. So that's really how the transition was, man. It was that, just kind of like just picking up something new that was necessary mm-hmm. and then learning you know, about it on my own, finding the community, a whole bunch of different people, a different community of folks, mm-hmm. connecting with them, and then learning from them, and then just kind of just following their footsteps based on everything that everybody else was doing as far as just the video was concerned, like, let me get really good at that. That's mm-hmm. what I wanted to do. Um, because I still didn't have, you know, I, as, as a videographer, you know this, man, you can never have enough gear. Like, every time you get a camera, oh, there's yeah. another camera that you want. You see another, all right, look at that one, or whatever. So for a long time, it was just like, okay, let me 
get enough work and let me do enough work to justify and get enough bread for me to get the camera that I really want, which mm-hmm. is the one I have now. It's A7, A7 III. Um, okay. And then, again, until I get the next. But, yeah, man, but, yeah, that, that, that stabilized video and then developing a visual style, that was big, man. That was big because that was able to get me, you know, jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, some jobs. Let me put together something and let someone see it. Yeah. And they're like, okay, I like the way yours looks, like that style. I like mm-hmm. that. Um, you know, and I think that's really important for us, especially for any videographer, anybody that does what we do. It's like, hey, there's lots of different niches, there's lots of different things or whatever. But if you have your own visual style where it's like, as soon as someone sees it, they know, oh, that's content factor. Like, mm-hmm. I know that's RJ. Why? Because it's just the way the lighting is. It's like people say Michael Bay. He always does like the the, the, the lens flares and whatnot, right? And mm-hmm. stuff like that. You know what I mean? So it's like just developing a style. When you develop a style where people can know it's yours without you putting putting your name on it, mm-hmm. and that's when you know you're doing something. Yeah. And it's always like even when you develop your style, like it's like I was about to ask you a question, like, oh, how long did it take you to develop your style? Usually, like, for, usually, like you develop your, your style is like damn near like your fingerprint. Yeah, it's like it, like your even though your first photo shoot yeah. may not come out exactly as you wanted and. Pop, polished as, as clean as you want it. Yeah. But you just develop based off of that. Yeah. And you just get better and better at capturing the image that you see in your head. Yeah. You know? So, like, like your style is your style. Like, you just gotta trust it and just keep on developing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it ain't like you, you, you discover it more as you grow. You yeah. come to find your own, you, you come to discover yourself. Yeah. As far as, like, the style and the certain shots that you like, why you like shooting at this angle. Yeah. I like shooting it with this type of lens, yeah. but you only learn that through like Yo, repetition. Yeah. yeah, you have to do by practical application, man. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure, man, for sure. I mean, you know that that definitely is move. Like even with that, like even as I was developing the style, man, it was just like one one big part of that was um, lenses, and it was like uh, that was probably the next biggest like you know. What was your lens? What was that lens that that you feel like? In your early in your earlier stages, because it always changes. Yeah, well, I tell you. So for me, what's, what's the lens that you in the early stages that you was like, yo, this is this is this is. It's two. Like, all right. So just in photography, um, there's a Minolta. Um, it's a uh, it's a, uh, a twenty five to seventy mm-hmm. old school Minolta. Right. This is like you know before Sony. Like Sony bought Minolta, so they bought that tech. Mm-hmm. This was like an actual Minolta lens, man. It was a beer can lens. And that one, like I'm talking about, it was just crazy. Like that was one of my favorite ones. Like I literally bought that for an older camera just to be able to use it. But the one lens that really changed the game for me is shooting on a crop sensor is the the 50 millimeter um, uh, for the uh, for the Sony for the uh, Sony A6000. Like just I remember talking to um, my man Donovan at Best Buy, and he's the person that recommended it to me. And it was like he, I was showing him my work, and he was like, "Yo, man, like you need this lens." And I'm like, "Okay, you know, I wasn't really feeling." These, it's like, trust me, it's no zoom, but just trust me. How you shoot, trust me, this one, 50, 50 millimeter. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I've been listening to Peter McKenna and all the rest of them. You know, nifty 50, nifty 50. That's a great lens to start with. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting it from him and just being skeptical. Be like, you know, because I wanted to get a different drone. Actually, mm-hmm. I wanted to get a new drone. I came in for that. Um, and he convinced me to buy the lens instead. And I remember I bought the lens. I went out to the parking lot, and I opened it all the way up to, one. I think it was 1.8. Uh, 1. 1. 1.4, I think, 1.4. And I just thought, wait a minute. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I'm like, I can see way more. Like, wait a minute. So then I immediately left. And I went to, I remember I went to Rocco's Tacos. Because uh-huh. they have these these lights that hang out of the trees. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, I want to take a, I want to see what these look like. And I just started just practicing with that. I remember that's just the first two or three images that I took just when I got it in focus. And I got it right. And I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay, you start seeing like okay the depth of field, and then you start seeing oh I'm like okay this here is different. Yeah, that 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 um that prime lens is something, boy. That shows that shows you the real deal. The real deal. And and honestly, that was my first prime lens that I was able to know the difference between a prime and a and a zoom zoom lens. Yeah. I I had a zoom. Yeah. I had the um the twenty four to seventy. That was like one of my that's like my money maker because I was working in parties and stuff like that. But um that fifty. I started with the first one was the Canon 50, but ever since I got that 150, yeah. when I went to Nikon, I got the 50. 50, yeah, that's the first one, yeah. When I, like, when yeah. I went to Sony, it's the 50. 50. That's the first thing I got when I upgraded and so my cheap. body. Yes, yeah, it is. The first thing I got when I upgraded my body at 50, so it's yeah. just like. Well, it's not cheap, but it's like, even like, say for instance with Canon at the time, 
if you was to get a 50, just a regular Canon 50, it's like 200, 200 bucks, bucks, 150. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then if you want to get an L version, yeah, you now that's, yeah, that's, that's when you're going to be, block, yeah, 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 but yeah. But still, though, be, man, it's just like, you but know. With yeah. Nikon, the same thing. Nikon was like, you could get a 50 millimeter 1.4, 1.8 for like, probably 1.8 for like the same thing, 200 bucks. But if you get a 1.4, you might be in the threes. Threes, yeah. You know what I mean? And then like uh, with Sony, it's the same thing. Sony is like five, I think like four, five, yeah. four. Yeah. Yeah. A good Sony fifty millimeter lens, and that that right there separates. It upgrades your style like it just choo! does instantly, instantly. It's like, it forces you, and you got to use it though. It's yeah. not only like you just got the fifty. You went out there, and you shot. You use like it. I had an idea of shooting. Let me this see sign. what it's gonna look like. Let me go out there and actually go out there Man, and shoot and put it in that work and constantly learning how to use that fifty yeah. and. Curve your style from that. I tell you that in the prime lens, man, like when I started shooting, so I started shooting fashion. I started shooting a lot of fashion mm -hmm. and models and stuff like that, man. You know, like portraits type of stuff because it was dope. And like that 50, it makes you, those prime lenses, man, they make you, it forces you to learn, all right, I really need to be standing right here to frame the shot up. Like, okay, I need to be at this angle. Okay, I need to be at this distance. Like, you know, you, and you start planning, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, the shots before you start making, okay, how tall is the model? Okay, five foot. Okay, I'm going to have to be back a little bit. Far. Okay, how how much? Point? You just start. Yeah. It forces you to learn the art form. Like, it forces you spacing, to. Spacing, especially. Yeah, spacing. spacing here. Like, like, you know, okay, I can't shoot this. I can't shoot this. Exactly. I'm going to need a 24, a 24 inch 30, Yeah, I need okay. 35. Yeah, so I need I something like, yeah, exactly, man. Yeah. So. That was that was sweet, and then you know once again you know once you start shooting a little bit of fashion, you start doing you know swimwear or whatnot, man, and uh, that gets a lot of you know how it works. It gets a lot of photographers and videographers' attention. Yeah. You start paying attention, like oh well, wow, you know, they look at you know eye candy. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. But then they're like, okay, well, I like him compared to whatever, whatever. And then people start to and that's when you start getting a little business, and mm -hmm. you know once once people start to call you, hey, could you do my little photo shoot? Could you do hey whatever whatever? You know that's when you start to say, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm getting a little bread here. Like, okay, this is a viable business. Let me let me go ahead and you know let me let's figure out a way where we can make this thing generate some income. You know, consistently. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, man. And the lens to me is the best best investment. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like getting a good lens and and, and, and making sure because it, it holds its value. So people, man, like prime zoom. I always started with a twenty four and mm -hmm. seventy, but uh, when we went to primes. I kind of stayed with the fifties, and then as soon as I was able to get. I need I I like the fifty yeah. for portraits and stuff like that. But yeah. I was doing a lot of events. Yeah. I was doing a lot of parties and stuff like that. So yeah. I had a um I had a a, a D a T two I okay and a one D like Mark three okay yeah. okay yeah those are good man yeah yeah you know what I mean so I had like the fifty on this and I had like a twenty four to seventy over here mm -hmm. but then once I switched and went to um went to Nikon I was I was uh I went with a D three hundred and I had a D700, mm -hmm. and I had a 50 mil. I had a 50, and I had a 28 mm -hmm. millimeter. Mm -hmm. um, both 1.8. Um, and I had a long lens. Mm -hmm. I had a 24 to 70. 20, I mean, I had a 70 to 200. To 200, yeah. And 2.8. Yeah. So I had two primes. I right. had the 28, and I had the 50. Right. And then a, tw and, uh, a 24 to those are the two lenses that I got when I got my A6. My I got well, yeah, I got a uh, 24 to 70, and then I got a 70 to 200. 70 to 200. And yeah. you know it's funny because the dude that sold me the camera, he had a 50 millimeter, and I was like, I don't need that 50, man. Just let me get the two zooms because I wasn't really, I just, I just was not aware. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I was just like, let me just get the zoom lenses, whatever, man. And he was like, you sure you don't want that 50, man? I was like. You know, he at the time he was only selling for two hundred dollars. I didn't realize that lens was like you know six hundred dollar lens at the time and how good it was. Um, and I really I, I kicked myself in the ass almost because I wish I had gotten it then because it probably my style would have been different. I'd have been further along now, but kind of is what it is. But yeah, it's just kind of ironic. Like I had those two lenses. That seventy two hundred is is wicked too. The two point eight I had mm -hmm. that for crop sensor for that you know for the a six hundred too. But yeah. and I rarely use those. You know, I didn't use those too too much. That's when you know. Mm -hmm. Basically, I find myself really. I like the closer up stuff. I like to be get in there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean. So it's like you know. I I assume that after I start doing maybe we just start doing some stuff that's further away to be cool. But I, don't know, I like I like getting in the action, man. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so tighter focus focal lens. Yeah, yeah, nah. Like I had to go wide because I was doing a lot of parties. But the the tight lenses for sure. Like 
And then, like, w- like so even with cultivating your style, we got into the arts, we got into the creative stuff. Like, so on being able to pitch and show your value as far as, like, pitching it to these different businesses, these different companies, finding out how to how to even come up with a, a quote or what, a proposal or anything like that. Like, um, how was that? Like, how was that journey like? Well, man, like, you know, honestly, like, I had a lot of experience doing all of that already, mm-hmm. you know, because, like I said, you know, I did sales for, you know, for 20 years beforehand. And, you know, I tell you, I probably learned the most about pitching and proposals when I worked for Cox Media, for Hot 105 and, and the 99 Jams, man. Literally, like, I was learning how to write proposals. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's just not only just writing a proposal, but making a proposal that is visually appealing to, mm-hmm. to the client, man. That one is, it's one of the things, you know, that kind of drove me to go to art school uh-huh. um, is, uh, you know, my, my sales manager, when I did my, one of my first proposals and I laid it out and I gave it to her and I was sure to say, hey, this is what I'm going to take to the client. She went through it. And she was like, this is like a work of art. Like, this looks like art. And I was like, wow, cool. And it was my first one. It was just mm-hmm. me naturally doing my thing because I wanted it to look nice. Um, but man, like, you know, just learning that part of it, you know, learning customer focused selling, you know what I'm saying? Like just a lot of the things, the majority of things that we're doing right now in an old school type of way, like not the same type of data and access that we have now, but just the methods, you know what I mean? You know, answering, asking questions, critical questions to ask, you know, prospecting, all of these things, you know, I had the opportunity really to learn while I was doing that. So you know, to be able to apply them, I would say that I had like an advantage, you know, mm-hmm. when it came to, you know, going to a client confidently and being able to say, okay, well, here are my strengths here, you know, here, here are the benefits of doing business with me. I was able to explain it in, in a way that even with me not being maybe as skilled as a lot of mm-hmm. other, you know, I mean, photographers or videographers, I was able to get my foot in the door just because of the way that I was able to communicate, the way I was able to pitch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so and that's, and that's a big part of it. I, you know, I still, it still holds true to this day. You know, we got really cool processes and methods right now to be able to generate leads. But, you know, the main thing is, is I'm, you know, I'm really, really confident with is and confident with is like when I get someone on the telephone, you know, I'm, I have no fear as far as being able to try to sell them, explain what it is that I'm doing, pitch what it is that I'm doing and hype it up and just build it up and just get them excited about mm-hmm. it. Like that's kind of just a natural thing that I do. So I, I was fortunate, but only because I had that much experience from doing telephone sales, which I did for, you know, the better part of a decade, managing teams, doing telephone sales, to doing business-to-business sales on the phone, to doing outside sales, like, you know, door-to-door sales, you know, selling business stuff, like, you know, even selling, I was selling um, um, printed products. And this is when I was in art school, I worked for a print shop, so mm-hmm. Speedy. So I learned all of the, the, you know, the nuances about printing and different things like that, too, and graphic design as well, mm-hmm. and also learn how to sell paper. And it's like, okay, you start learning to sell to all kinds of different groups of people, that, you know, in larger amounts, like, you know, when I was at Hot 105, I had a, you know, I had a budget of a million dollars that I had to meet, you know mm-hmm. what I mean, every year. So it's like, you got to go out and find big business. So just learning the language, you know, I think that's a, you know, that's something that, you know, is that I try to pass on, you know what I mean, to the folks that I'm around, um, you know, as far as the language that you need to be able to have conversations with, like C-level employees and, you know, the things that you need to say and how you need to sell that'll just be able to get your foot in the door so they can see your actual talent. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a big opportunity for a lot of, of, of young, you know, entrepreneurs out there, young creatives out there um, to be able to learn those types of things, learn that language and be able to come in and have a conversation that's going to give them the opportunity to show these folks mm-hmm. their brilliance. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, man. So, yeah, like, just, again, it's just, Years of training from telephone sales to outside sales to inside sales, business to business sales, like all of it. I was just fortunate to get that experience, and I just applied that to what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and that's and that's really what it is when it comes to like really like um, starting a business and sustaining it. You got to sell. Yeah. If you're not selling, you don't have a business. You don't have a business. You know, exactly. and and that's another thing too. Even when it comes to that, it's like if 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 you, it's always great ways of partnerships. You uh-huh. know what I mean? Like yeah. so, even with me, it's like. I'm great at selling. Right. You know, that's that's what I do. Right. But um in order for us to be a powerhouse, it has to take part it takes partnerships. Right. Um like that's that like like um I think it was two thousand nineteen or something like that, man. I woke up, I was like, 
It's all about partnerships. Yeah. It's a new business model. It is. You know, it's a new yeah. business model. It's no more like this hierarchy thing. And like a lot of people, they're looking, they're like, oh, a lot of times they'd be like, oh, who's who's the boss? It's like, this is a 100% yeah. partnership yeah. In, this, in this building, you know? Yeah. Uh, who's taking lead right now? My brother over here is leading the, leading the shoot. Um, but yeah, it's a partnership. So I'm RJD. This is, you know, this is that. And today we're working with this uh, company right here. So if you need, um, if you need any help, you can always connect with it. any questions. You can ask me. Um, if I can answer, I answer it for you. But um, otherwise, you know, um, 1881 is running the show today. Like you know what I mean? That's that's. That's what it is, but it's like it could be then the other day, the next day, where it's like okay, um, today it's um, I'm here such and such, and Content Factory is um, running this show, so it's never like it's it's I've always seen it as being useful to the next um, company or the next next agency, um, the next person, mm-hmm. whether it's whether it's um, me selling my own services in my own company, mm-hmm. or then. Um, being able to add value to another agency that does the same exact the same thing, thing as me, yeah. you know, like that's like that's like one of the number one things where, where like majority of everything that I majority of the in, majority of our um, yearly income comes from collaboration stuff. from different marketing agencies, yeah. and different content creation creation yeah. agencies. Yeah, we're doing work with them. Yeah. And they're doing work with us, or or they're just doing or we're just doing work for them. We may be we may be their content team, yeah, to create content, whether it's events, whatever it is, yeah, whether it's commercials, behind the scenes footage, whatever the case may be. Yeah. That collaboration, yeah. man, is like. Let me tell you, man. Like you know, I think like it's especially like with how the world is operating now, man, post COVID, and with people being forced to you know to work remotely. Um, and then, you know, all of these entrepreneurs now suddenly springing up and the whole great resignation and all of that, man. It's like, you know, I think the world is starting to understand and embrace that, you know, the whole traditional hierarchy of work is really, is, you know, depending on, the, you know, some industries and depending on, you know, certain things, it might work. But generally, man, it's like no one wants to be ruled anymore. No one wants to be, you know, ruled over anymore. You know what I mean? If I'm working for a company, I want a part of the company. I don't mm-hmm. want to be working for the company. I want to. I want, I want some ownership. Like people want that now. Mm-hmm. If they're going to be working for a company, so the whole collaborative thing is great, man. It's like you're right. I mean, it's the same way. It's just like you know, we work with y'all. Y'all work with us. You know, I'm you know, I'm collaborating with you know, with Javon McKenzie. I mean, there's lots of like all around, man, mm-hmm. and like everyone feeds each other, and there's no boss there's no leader there's, it's not like that man and it's like you know I think that that's important mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying it's like alright you know given a, cer- a certain situation what I think is really unique about that especially within our group man you mm-hmm. know what I mean? because you know and, you know, probably the best example of that I'm thinking is the shoot that we did for you know with uh, Thermaband um, with Javon yeah. and it's just like you know everybody understands you know when we have a group that's you know that is constantly working together has Similar or the same type of of, of, of of SOPs, you know what I'm saying? Um, understands each other, culturally understands each other, and environmentally and, you know, environment. They understand each other. When they get to work, and that all that communicates into, into the job, man. Mm-hmm. And then whichever situation might happen in the job that presents itself, whoever is best suited to handle that situation naturally steps up. Mm-hmm. Like there was, you know, some times when we were doing a shoot where Javon would be fully in charge and he's running the whole show and everyone's listening to him. And it might be another situation where you were, you stepped up mm-hmm. and you start talking and you're leading that situation and you're taking care of it because the conversation or situation that's going on, you're familiar with. And there's a situation in there when I stepped up and I was leading the conversation because, you know, it was my vibe and I needed to be able to take care of that. So, and then same thing with Rose. So, all of us collectively together, man, understanding where we fit in the team and where we fit as far as the project goes. And that there isn't any leader, or mm-hmm. there isn't any one person, like, you know, kind of putting it down like that. It lets everybody, it gives everybody the option to be as free as they want and then to move on to things that they know that they know they're good at. Mm-hmm. It's just a natural process. So, when, you know, collectively, it's just more effective. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, I mean, you saw the result of what happens, you know, when, when we did that. 
as far as the, the customer satisfaction, the quality of the product, and the overall satisfaction of the team when we're done. And you mm-hmm. can't beat it, man. The collaboration is definitely the way to go. That's, that's the way of the future. For sure. Yeah, yeah, man. So like that's sure. that's that's definitely, man. That's where that's where we we're, that's what we're doing. You know, we're not just talking about it. We're doing it on a daily basis, that's making right. sure that we're forming these partnerships. That's right. And and um, I'm I'm just talking about between the creatives and also um, even tight like learning from each other, ironing yeah. and sharpening each other. Yeah. You know, um, so that way we could better like connect with more people exactly, and be able to man. help more businesses and exactly. learn different ways on how exactly. we can help more businesses. Because that's really what it comes down to is like we're learning all of these skills, whether it's going back to art school. So that way we could then be able to provide something to someone that's going to help their business benefit grow, yeah. benefit their business, or Absolutely, advertise, man. or market that business, Absolutely. or market that um, city, yeah. you know, or that t-shirt, yeah. or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 it's really that culture, because like, um, I was just um, talk, I was talking with um, Raul today, I was like, yo, I got this idea, and... I want to go for a certain vibe. I'm going for a certain vibe of like, I have arrived. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have arrived. Whether in what city, in this city, this town, this country, wherever. Mm -hmm. Something that represents that feeling. Mm -hmm. You know? And then just searching for those, that that, that, that shot that's going to give us that feeling. Mm -hmm. And not only the shot, the sound, the sound effect in Mm -hmm. the background. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. How can we then create something like that? You know what I mean? Yeah. So going into a brainstorming situation, like imagine you just having to deal with that and just coming up with that self stuff by yourself. Sometimes people prefer to do that, but um, for me, um, I have no problem yeah. with starting with an idea, yeah. hearing your idea, da, 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 going back and forth, be like, all right, this is the anchor. This is where we want to put our anchor at. We want it to be. Uh, we want it to be a dynamic shot. Now, what is a dynamic shot? We want it to be like, like big. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna use a wide lens. That's my only. That's the anchor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The wide lens. <laughs> yeah. You know, but let's build the idea around, around that. that yeah. I arrive. We could use multiple different things. Yeah. But I just want a wide lens on that shot. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's important, man. You know what I mean? It's like you know, like. Adding people to your team, you know, again, it gives you the opportunity to be able to do more of what it is that you like, right? And then it's like, and that's another thing, too. It's like as you start in your journey, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, you're doing video, whatever it is, man. Mm-hmm. Like, the better that you mean, you always start off with a one-man show because it's all, you know, one-man, one-woman show. It's gonna be, you know, it's going, all right, this is my, my brainchild, right? Mm-hmm. And then you start to work on it, man, and then, you know, you'll get to a point in your journey where, you, you know, you're gonna, you make a decision like, wait a minute. Okay, am I? This is going to be the thing I do, and if it is, okay, I need to bring other people on because I can't, I can't do it all on my own. And you know, bringing people in, I mean, you know, and growing the business, like you know, it feels good to have more than just one person working. And mm-hmm. then you, you look up, and then you start doing these collaborations, you know, collaborations, and you, you start these partners. You look around, like, wow, I got eight, nine, ten people working with me. This is good. This is an actual company. And then you start paying out big checks. You start paying out people. You get a big crew of, you know, five, six, eight to ten people working and then you pay them all out. There's nothing better than that. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, man, the growth is, is, is fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, the and more people you have, the more you grow. So. Yeah, and I, I, you know what I love about it, man? It's all just, like, energy, bro. It's like, the thing I love about it is, like, if you're just there by yourself, especially as an artist, I've done work by myself and grinded many years just as a photographer, a single photographer, just me just out there grinding. Mm-hmm. You'll get burned out, yeah, right? Yeah. And you don't have anybody else to talk to about this creative stuff because right. your, pe- your, your cousins ain't into that. Right. Your homeboys ain't into that. Right. You, you on your own by yourself. Right. You don't have nobody else to talk about photography, no content creation, no ideas, bounce ideas with. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. you can't do that with just regular people. You ain't even thinking about that. Right. You feel what I'm saying? Right. So, right. Right. like, when you have somebody, as you build a team and the energy get bigger and bigger, it's really just that energy that get bigger and bigger that that creativity that um, solves solutions. Yeah. Like, and just being able to brainstorm with someone else is like, so good. That's bomb, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, again, you know, even like, you know, most of the stuff that we came up with as far as, um, you know, our lead generation, you know, it was, you know, Javon McKenzie and I collaboration. You know, he showed me a lot and I learned a lot from him. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So, and that's the thing. It's just like, you know, there's a lot of stuff I just wasn't aware of. And he showed me some things that I, I can do. I get the charter for them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. 
I'm gonna have to peel in a minute, man. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Dan. Okay, I'm starting to just wrap it up now, so um, I'll be over there shortly, okay? All right. Throw him on there. Boy, that yeah. big boy, he always he charged everybody. Yeah, <laughs> How long did it take to charge that up, man? For the whole lick? Damn. I know them LP batteries be taking four days to charge. I'm gonna have to just get one. How much that cost? Oh, okay, yeah, he's like that. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, that was a, my bad, bro. That was a game changer for me, man. But nah, man. So yeah, we was talking about like your collaboration with um, Javon, which is coming up with like different ideas on how to get in front of, um, you know, new new clients, new customers, and not only new clients, new customers, but just uh, qualified people, just not, and when I say qualified, I mean like people that is ready to, to market, yeah. ready to to have some some kind of budget, 